Thank you so much for joining me for our wonderful keynote today. Our keynote will be delivered by Dr. Yvonne Hilton from Lincoln University. And just a little bit of background on Dr. Hilton. She's worked in 28 years in higher education and has received her bachelor's degree from Lincoln University. And she did her graduate work at University of Delaware and at Wilmington University. She has a passion for and a willingness to address the needs of a diverse population in a challenging and caring learning environment. And she's given herself to the service of the university community at Lincoln University. We welcome Dr. Hilton as our keynote for our ASB East Coast, and I look forward to hearing what she has to say. All right, Dr. Hilton, you can share your screen. Thank you. I ask you to just bear with me for a second here. I'm trying to pull it up. Okay, can you all see this? Can, can you see this? I'm sorry. Not okay. yet. Okay, because it's showing the little box as if <laughs> everyone's up here. All right, let me try this. I'm so sorry. It's all right. Okay, how about now? It's starting. It's, yep. Okay, very good. Having a little technical difficulties today, but that's okay. We're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. So, um, again, um, or first, I'd just like to thank um, everyone. I don't know how many people are here, who is here, but I, I appreciate everyone um, coming in to, to hear what I have to say. I thank um, doctors Singles and Mahoney um, for their time and attention to me through, through this. So my plan today is to just really share um, a little bit about the history of HBCUs, um, a little bit regarding the history of Lincoln University, my alma mater, and uh, then maybe, you know, talk a little bit about my personal background, my personal story. And I think those um, pieces of information will give you some context um, in relating to and possibly um, getting more students um, of uh, or up from underrepresented populations to become interested in uh, biomechanics. So that is my that is my uh, task today, my pleasure today. So with that, let's begin. Um, just a very very brief history regarding HBCUs. Uh, HBCUs or historically black colleges and universities has a very very long history. And um, I would encourage those of you um, who are here, if you haven't done so already, is to uh, watch the doc documentary called Tell Them We Are Wrong Information. So I will start um, by saying that obviously slaves were not allowed to be educated. It was viewed as one of those things where if they know too much, then they'll, they'll do too much, they'll ask too much. And so that very thing that um, slaves were forbidden to have became something that was very, very important to them. But it really wasn't until after the Civil War that um, people who were once slaves and freedmen um, could actually begin to um, participate in schooling. Um, at that time, Blacks began to open up their own schools and they were not necessarily trained. It was just a matter of sharing. Any information that they've learned, uh, that they've acquired, that they would learn, I mean, they would teach. Um, so they began to open up their own schools. And actually prior to the Civil War, there was one institute that was opened in 1837 by Quakers uh, called the Institute for Colored Youth. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, or mention it again later on. But really prior to the Civil War, nothing was happening. So after the Civil War again, they began to open up their own schools and the 
um, American Missionary Association, which is a obviously a Christian um, organization. They were very much involved in abolition and preparing um, freed blacks to be what they would consider uh, uh, civilized individuals. And so they started the, the um, putting black schools, which eventually became colleges in the South. The AME Church also um, got involved in creating black schools. And their biggest point was they really believed that blacks needed to do these things on their own. They were trying to get away from uh, the racism and the paternalism that came along with the whites establishing schools for blacks. And then of course, the federal government also uh, got involved with creating uh, black colleges. So we have these three entities who are very much interested um, in the education of freed black men. Each of them have their own ideals about what that should look like. Um, by the late 1800s, there were well over 86 black colleges um, on the, the eastern and southern portions of the United States. But that did not come very easily. There was a lot of uh, fighting. There was a lot of arguing. Um, there were a lot of people killed about 20,000 people between um, alike were killed. The perceived threat, again, that if black people know too much, they're going to, um, they're going to know too much, and which means the demands become greater. So there was um, a lot of um, apprehension, needless to say, around that. Now, there are many, many people who were involved uh, in the history of black education. But I'm only bringing up two because I kind of felt like these two particular individuals uh, were very, very prominent in the beginnings of the establishment of um, higher institutions for black people. Booker T. Washington um, was one of the first and his um, Education began obviously in the late 1800s. Uh, he was born in 1856. He was actually born into slavery. So his ideals behind um, education once he became a freed man was about industrial education or educating the black man within the trades so that he could um, be car they could be carpenters, um, cooks, uh, blacksmiths and all of those kinds of things uh, that made them marketable among white society. W.E.B. Du Bois, however, had a totally different ideal about educating black people. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois came from a very different background. He, um, Booker T. Washington grew up in Virginia. W.E.B. Du Bois grew up in Massachusetts and he, he was born a free black man. And so in Massachusetts, um, the education there was actually integrated. So he went to an integrated school. He did not suffer all of the um, um, ills that Booker T. Washington did during his time of growing up. So their ideals behind education are a bit different. So W.E.B. Du Bois really felt as though black people needed to be educated for higher pursuits, law, medicine, politics, uh, and things of that nature. So even though the, the, the thrust of black education in the early 1800s was that uh, of industrial means, in the early 1900s, there was that shift that began to take place in black education from just the industrial arts into those higher pursuits. Oh, by the way, um, um, Booker T. Washington 
Um, he graduated, he went to Hampton University, actually walked from West Virginia and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, as I said, he um, grew up in Massachusetts and he went to Fisk University and got his degree there. And later he got his degree, um, his master's degree from Harvard and he became the first African-American person to get a doctorate degree from Harvard, the same institution. Now, the, these next two slides here, this one uh, is really a picture of um, what a black school would look like in the early 1900s, late 1800s. So on the right, or excuse me, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see um, a picture of a schoolhouse, and that was from the 1900s, the early 1900s. <clears throat> excuse me. On the, on the right, is another picture of a black school um, and that picture is from the late 1800s. So the idea here is to show again what the mindsets were or could have been of those early pioneers in black education. They've come from this and the, the, the desire to learn was obviously very serious because there was no heat, there were no outhouses, there was nothing like that uh, for them to partake of except whatever the teacher at that time had to share with them. This next picture coming up here is a picture of a one-room schoolhouse that was actually built in Massachusetts in the late eight, uh, 1700s. So I know it looks, it looks so much prettier and I'm sure that they, it definitely was. Um, I, the school that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois attended uh, was the Searles School, um, which unfortunately I, I did not uh, get a picture of, but it was also built in the 1700s in Massachusetts. So this kind of gives us an idea of what W.E.B. Du Bois was looking at um, and what he experienced um, during his um, primary and secondary education. On top of that, again, it was an integrated school. Okay, so with HBCUs, there, there are, right now, there are approximately 107 um, historically black colleges and universities in the United States. And this um, slide here is just some of those institutions. There's 32 listed here, 60 plus others. And so oftentimes, you know, we might hear of these schools and not recognize that they are historically black institutions. And some of these individuals, such as Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, were responsible for their establishment. They, um, they taught at, at certain ones of these schools and um, other people that came up behind them obviously were um, either graduates or they helped to found some of these institutions. But there are uh, three on this next slide that I want to make mention of, specific mention of. One is Cheney University. And um, Cheney University is in Pennsylvania. It is the first uh, institution that was established um, for Blacks. It was first established, I mentioned it before, the Institute for Colored Youth as a high school and then it evolved into um, an institution of higher learning. So it was established in 1837 by um, Richard Humphreys. And so he commissioned that this school begin again to uh, educate black youth. The second is my very own Lincoln University, established in 1854 by John Miller Dickey. And I'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, these two schools, there's this little uh, running joke of who's the first. So Lincoln University is actually the first degree granting institution, even though Cheney was established prior to Lincoln. They did not grant um, higher education degrees at the time. The last one is Wilberforce University. And Wilberforce University is in Ohio. And um, it was the third established in 1856 by Daniel Payne. So 
So some interesting facts um, regarding historically black colleges and universities. Um, these institutions, they have um, an eighth of the size of some of the endowments of some historically white colleges, but they still manage to graduate a majority of the nation's black teachers, judges, engineers, um, scientific professionals, even with that little bit of, of money, okay? HBCUs produce about 22% of current bachelor's degrees among those granted to African Americans. Um, they also produce about 44% of all African American bachelor's degrees in communications. 33% of bachelor's degrees are awarded um, for engineering technology from HBCUs. And about 43% of bachelor's degrees that are awarded among all African American college students um, who graduate from college, HBCU graduates represent about 40% of those who sit on um, members of Congress, approximately 12.5% of CEOs about 50% of professors at non-HBCU colleges, about 40% of engineers, about 50% of attorneys, and 80% of judges. So I think this really speaks, these kinds of things really speak to the strength of our HBCUs and what it is doing for our Black community. Our typical HBCU student, um, they are first generation college students. So their parents um, obviously haven't graduated from college. Um, many of them had not finished high school. And I know that I was in that, that particular group of students and I'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. 71% are low income, come from low income families. So they're relying on um, Pell Grants in order to go to school and 94% are awarded some type of financial aid, um, including PLUS loans and things of that nature. So that is our typical HBCU student across all HBCUs. So a very brief history of Lincoln University. Um, as I mentioned, and I think uh, Dr. Singles mentioned that it is my alma mater. I, graduated in um, 1988. This institution, as I said before, was established by John Miller Dickey, who was a Presbyterian minister um, at Oxford Presbyterian Church. And Lincoln University is about four miles from Oxford, Pennsylvania. It's established in 1854, and um, Dickey decided and fought to uh, build Lincoln University as a result of his interactions with um, James Ralston Amos and his brother Thomas. Um, Dr. Dickey was trying to get um, um, James Amos into a school, several schools um, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And he was being turned down. He was a very, um, so Dr. Dickey decided that he would train um, James himself, James and his brother, for the ministry. And so he began the process of um, establishing Lincoln after he began training uh, James Amos. So James would um, walk from where he lived to Dr. Dickey uh, four miles each way every day. And um, he would stop and pray at um, a place um, on Lincoln's campus, which is now Lincoln's campus. Um, and one of the buildings there, Ashman, um, is where he used to pray in that area. The original name of Lincoln University was Ashman Institute, and that was named for um, Jehudi Ashman, who was um, part of the American Colonization Society, and they were um, abolitionists, and they wanted to, and they did, 
um, go and colonize or Christianize, I should say, um, parts of Africa. So they were preaching the gospel in Africa. So it's, it was originally named for him. And of course, the mission at the time was to educate black, freed black men um, for the ministry. But in 1866, the charter and the name changed. Um, it changed to Lincoln University in honor of Abraham Lincoln. And um, the charter changed to not just um, educate black men for ministry, but to educate men uh, of all complexions, all climes, um, to be um, more productive in society. So they, they also wanted to educate not just black men, but white men or any other um, man that was interested in furthering his education. It was known as the Black Princeton uh, because practically all of the faculty and administration at the time came from Princeton University. They were Princeton educated people. So former presidents and faculty were Princeton graduates. And so uh, they um, modeled Lincoln University or Ashman Institute after Princeton University. So for the first 100 years of its existence, it was known as the Black Princeton. During that time, um, they educated hundreds and hundreds of Black men, one of which it was the first Black president of the institution, Dr. Horace Mann Bond. And Dr. Bond um, wrote a book called Education for Freedom, which talks about the, uh, obviously, the, the history of Lincoln University. It's an excellent book, I own it, and um, I would recommend it to anybody. It's a long read, but it's a, it's a very good book. And he became president in um, 1945. He graduated in, I believe, 1923. In 1953, um, Lincoln began, to, but they began enrolling women in 19, early 1970s uh, is when women were actually allowed to stay on campus. So during its first 100 years of existence, um, Lincoln graduated approximately 20% of the African-American physicians in the US, graduated more than 10% of the African-American attorneys, in the US, um, the alumni have led more than 35 colleges and universities and many prominent churches and educated United States ambassadors, um, mission chiefs, federal, state, and municipal judges. So again, Lincoln has a very, very rich history. Um, just to share with you some of the firsts of Lincoln, um, here is a link on this page that can, um, you can copy if you'd like and read about some of the firsts of Lincoln University. But um, I wanna take this opportunity to um, show you some of those firsts and those people who are firsts concerning Lincoln. This man is um, Dr. Nathan Moselle. He is an 1879 graduate of Lincoln University a physician and the first African-American graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. This gentleman is Aaron Moselle. He is an 1885 graduate of Lincoln University and the first African-American to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. This gentleman is Kwame Nkrumah, graduate of 1939, um, and he became the prime minister and president of Ghana. This gentleman is um, Nkrumah, or excuse me, not Nkrumah, forgive me. This gentleman here is Nkrumah. The other one was Azikwe, forgive me. Um, Namdi and Z Azikwe, uh, he was the first one that came up. And he is a Nigerian, the Nigerian president at one point in time. This gentleman um, in color is Kwame Nkrumah, and he is the Ghana, or was the Ghana president. The next one is Hildreth Poindexter, and um, he was a bacteriologist, Dr. Poindexter, head of Howard Medical School. He's a graduate of Lincoln University, class of 1924. 
Langston Hughes, I think a lot of us probably have heard of or know, Langston, know of Langston Hughes. He's a poet, a social activist, and he was a writer, um, graduate of Lincoln University class of 1929. Thurgood Marshall, obviously the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. He graduated from Lincoln in 1930. This is Roscoe Lee Brown. He's an actor. He was an actor and a director, a uh, very prominent actor, known very well for his voice. Um, he's a graduate of Lincoln University, class of 1949. Again, Dr. Horace Mann Bond, class of 1923, educator, scholar, first American alumnus to become Lincoln's president. This gentleman is um, first African American faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania. The next gentleman, I accidentally put his picture up very quickly, is Dr. Martin Kilson, class of 1953, political scientist and the first black um, academic appointed to full professor at Harvard University. Now we've talked about, I've mentioned all of these men, but here come a few women for you. The first one is um, Lillian Fishburne. She is the class of 70, 1971. She is the first African-American to hold the rank of Rear Admiral in the United States Navy. This woman is Lily, um, excuse me, is um, Sheila Oliver, class of 1974. She's the first African-American female elected Lieutenant Governor of the state of New Jersey. This woman here, class of 1994. Her name is Sarah Kuganwa. She is the Prime Minister of um, Nam Nambia. And I cannot forget this woman, okay? This is Dr. Brenda Allen, class of 1981. She is the first female alumnus uh, to become president of Lincoln University. Now, just a, a little bit about me. I know I've kind of hinted to this before, but I'll talk about me. So I hope you don't mind a couple pictures of myself. Um, again, I, I um, was born in 1965 and I graduated high school in uh, 1983. I started attending Lincoln University in 1984. And so as you can see from this picture here, that's my old Lincoln ID. Um, I grew up with my great grandparents and like many of our HBCU students, um, I, I'm, a first, I'm a first generation. Uh, my great grandparents did not finish um, high school. I know that my great grandmother, she only got a sixth grade education. So my knowledge of what to do and how to navigate the system um, was, there was none. Um, when my great grandmother passed, I did move in with my mother and um, my mother also was not a, a high school graduate. She had not graduated from high school. So to have the, um, the knowledge that I needed to do what I needed to do just wasn't there. High school was important in, in my family. Um, my SAT scores were low. My guidance counselor told me that they were under 700 at that time. And um, name it pretty much, we, I dealt with it. Oh, Dr. Hilton, Hilton, we just lost your, your presentation. I think your connection got a little disrupted and we lost your presentation. Thank you. Good. Is the presentation back? Yep, it's good now. Thank you. Oh, okay. I am so sorry. That's I'm all right. Not, it just sure happened. happened. I wanted to catch it. Right. I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, um, 
So as I said, because of Lincoln, um, I, I made it through. And this is, this is something that most students will probably tell you regarding HBCUs. And one of the reasons why uh, some of the founders of HBCUs wanted to do so is because it is a space where um, that typical African-American student can feel comfortable. Um, it is a space where they can learn and grow. And it's a space that we really, uh, at Lincoln, we, we treat our students like family. Um, they're important to us, you know. So if, if they're not there, uh, if something is going on, we usually pick up on it, you know, we'll reach out to students. And so that was the kind of loving, caring um, um, atmosphere and experience I had at Lincoln. And because of that, um, I, I am where I am today. Um, I'm able to do what I am doing today. So um, this is 2020. Um, I graduated Lincoln, as I said, in 1988. I went on to the University of Delaware um, and graduated with my master's degree in physical education um, in 1990. And uh, I completed my doctorate degree in 2005 from Wilmington University. For uh, nine years, I worked at the University of Delaware in the recreation department and also taught some of their undergraduate courses in physical education. And so I had that, those opportunities because of my Lincoln education. I was not always um, the type of student who, um, as I mentioned, did well, but I, I also had some problems as far as social, socially, only because I, when I, I grew up in an all white neighborhood. So un, that's very much unlike a lot of our students today where they've grown up in, in predominantly black neighborhoods. I never had another uh, white student in my class until I got to the eighth grade, or black student, excuse me, in my class until I got to eighth grade. And I never had a black teacher until I was a 10th grader in high school. And so navigating that was kind of difficult for me. Um, um, I got into a lot of fights because I was angry about being picked on and teased and things like that. So some of our uh, students, you know, they don't have the experience that I have as far as growing up in, in a white neighborhood, but they feel the same types of pressures or can experience the same types of um, anxieties, I guess you could say, from growing up in uh, an all black or predominantly black neighborhood and maybe having to go, <clears throat> excuse me, to an all white institution. So they choose um, HBCUs, again, because it's that sense of family. And what we try to do is strengthen them, build them, encourage them uh, in who they are and what they can do so that by the time they do get out into the real world, um, they have two good strong legs to stand on and they have the educational background um, to make a difference and to make an impact. So that's just a little bit about um, me. I'm hoping that it's not allowing me to move forward. My screen is not allowing me to move forward. Oh, here we go. Are we all on this page together? We're all good. Okay, very good, thank you. So I wanted to share with you also uh, some recent graduate history of Lincoln University to kind of, since you are all um, um, biomechanists, right? Um, we don't have a biomechanics degree, but many of our students, um, they move forward and they do great things. So um, just a, a few of them are listed here and on the next slide. So you can see in, in 2007, um, we have a, a young lady who graduates from our institution and she goes on to Columbia University and gets her master's degree in nutrition. Um, it's a young man, um, Mr. Malamo Jansky, who got his master's degree um, in athletic training from North Carolina, uh, Greensboro, and he is now an assistant athletic trainer at Texas A&M. And Mr. Malamo Jansky's uh, name is highlighted there in a different color because he is actually um, a Caucasian student. Um, in 2018, we have the following students, um, Ms. Pendleton, who is now a physician's assistant, graduated from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. We have Ms. Rison, 
who has her master's degree in health administration, and she's now an administrative coordinator at White Oak Medical Center. Mr. Ngozi got his master's degree in human services, and he's a teacher now at Global Leadership Academy. Ms. Curtis is currently pursuing her master's degree in clinical and mental health at Walden University. Um, little updated here, we have 2019, the class of 2019, we have uh, four students here. Ms. Baldwin, she was also Lincoln University's valedictorian. Uh, she is pursuing her doctorate in physical therapy at Newman University right now. We have Mr. Blake pursuing his master's degree in health science at Towson University. Um, Mr. Gomes is pursuing his master's degree in athletic training at Salisbury University. Mr. Gill is a personal trainer for NBC. And just recently, two of our graduates, Ms. Johnson, Johnson Baker is pursuing her uh, master in social work degree at Temple University. And Ms. Ville is pursuing her master's in public health at A&T Still University. So our students do a broad range of things, and, and even students prior to these. Um, we have PTs, OTs, nurses um, that have sought out those careers, and uh, teachers, obviously, as well. So our students are doing great and wonderful things. Um, in my research for this particular talk, uh, I was trying to find some HBCUs that may have biomechanical um, degrees. And I thought I found one, but I think that program is no longer in existence, so I couldn't use it. But these are some of the top HBCUs with engineering programs. And I figured I would just share this with you um, because it obviously is, can be closely related to biomechanics. And those include Howard, Hampton, FAMU, Grambling, Tuskegee, Morgan, Jackson, Norfolk, Dell State, Claflin, Prairie View, Bethune, Cookman, Elizabeth City, and the list goes on. And this is not all of them, um, but they have great, great engineering programs. So in um, your quest to uh, attract students of um, color or underrepresented students, you know, these may be great institutions to begin to establish, um, establish contact with and um, get that going in that regard. So my last slide, I know I've talked a lot. Um, where do we go from here? And again, I think a good place to start could be making connections um, with Lincoln. So I appreciate the connection with Lincoln. Making connections perhaps with some of those other HBCUs that have the engineering programs. Uh, and it could be that some of these institutions really desire to um, branch out into kinesiology and um, um, biomechanics, but they, they haven't been able to do so. You may be instrumental in, in um, helping what you all do here, may be instrumental in helping um, programs like this become established at, at these institutions. Um, what do you think can and should be done to increase minority representation within your discipline? Uh, that's a good question to um, ask yourselves. And I'm sure in other um, sessions that you have throughout this week, you'll probably be asking that question. Um, one of the things that um, I had spoken with uh, Dr. Singles and Dr. Mahoney about is you know, possibly making those connections much, much early on, such as uh, at the middle school level. So if we can make those connections, even HBCUs, uh, we can begin to make those connections earlier on with the students uh, to get them interest, interested, to get them knowledgeable about what it is that all of the, uh, the sciences can do, what they can do with uh, degrees in, in science, that would be wonderful. And um, how, we make bio, how we can make biomechanics of interest. Um, you know what, I'm gonna leave that up to the professionals. I am not a biomechanist, but um, just talking with some of you uh, about what it is that you do can begin to generate the interest in our students. And so I know that Lincoln's doors um, when the, within the health science department would definitely be open to uh, this particular body of people to start those communications, to create those pipelines, um, to create those, those avenues of, of um, communication so that we can work together and
and get our students um, into, into your particular society. That is uh, all that I have for you. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions for me, but I am open. But either way, I thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hilton. That was wonderful. I wanna give you a big round of applause. It was really a wonderful talk. <laughs> Uh, we have, we ha I think we have plenty of questions for you and I'll give the attendees a moment to, to get those questions into our Q and A. Um, I have one already, but I just want to share my screen really quickly for the, uh, my thank you slide. Uh, okay, so the question that I have here says, thank you for the great talk. What are the factors that make HBCUs a safe and welcoming community for Black students to thrive? Is it only that the students are surrounded by peers that look like them, or are there other factors to consider? I think the biggest one, um, again, I'm talking from my own experience and uh, from my experience with my own students. I think the biggest one is being around students and, and many faculty who actually look like them. And um, having the um, that I guess you could say um, implied understanding of where I'm coming from as a black student helps them to gain that comfortability and be okay um, within the the space of an HBCU. Obviously, we have and um, we have a lot of uh, Caucasian faculty members and staff members, but they they really have a heart for the students. And so they are just as um, family oriented, you know, as those of us who look like our students. They're, they are the same. So I think, yes, that is the biggest part. Um, sure, there, could be, there uh, um, could be other things that go along with that, um, such as, you know, the parents, right? Um, I've, I've spoken to many, many parents and I let them know that um, I'm here for your son or your daughter, you know, and I've told them, I said, you know, I'm like a mom to them. I'm going to treat them like they were my own. And so they appreciate that. And so I think when um, the conversations between the parents and the children take place too, there's um, more of an encouragement and there's more, um, uh, what's the word? I, they feel more at ease. So when they're getting that at ease feeling from home, as well that that's helpful so i hope that answers your question that was great thank you very much kind of building on that what do you think are the best channels to reach out to in regard to advertising biomechanics organizations and programs for lincoln students just to build on that a little bit mm -hmm. biomechanics is not typically an undergraduate major. Um, I would say in general, biomechanics is more of a graduate endeavor for most of us um, through undergraduate in kinesiology or mechanical engineering or biomedical engineering or something similar. Uh, but what do you think are the best channels um, to promote biomechanics as a potential uh, future for your students? Okay, well, I think one of the, one of the best ways is to stay in contact with uh, people such as myself. I get a lot of um, emails and uh, advertisements from um, various professionals about what they're doing and what they'd like to do um, with, with our students. And we've been very, very good at extending those invitations uh, to our students. So we keep them informed about what is going on and the opportunities that are afforded them uh, while they are here at Lincoln uh, to to increase in their knowledge and to uh, you know try new things so a great avenue obviously is to stay in contact with us um, through the department themselves we also have obviously career services um, we have been getting <clears throat> excuse me we are we're not been getting we are very good at uh, reaching back out and having people come and speak with our students, whether it's during class or if it is uh, something outside uh, of normal class time and having those individuals like yourselves come and talk to them, right? So that you can 
share with them directly what those opportunities could look like for them and um, giving them a platform to ask questions, right? Not just through us, but they can ask the questions directly of those individuals um, who are in the discipline and getting direct answers from you. That's always of great help. And I think over the past few years, um, with some of the new people that we have on board, one of which I know is in this session right now, I'm going to call her out, um, almost Dr. Brown. Uh, she's been a great help in, in doing those kinds of things and taking those initiatives so that our students have the opportunities. I'll just ask a question while we're waiting for our attendees to ask additional questions, but what would you say in your experience were some of the main barriers for you in a, um, in a mostly white learning environment? And how were they changed in, a, in, a, in the environment provided by an HBCU? Um, <clears throat> well, I can tell you one of the biggest barriers for me um, at that time was in trying to treat me like every other student, um, I ended up getting mistreated. And so uh, this, was, this was really in uh, my primary years, K through, K through eight. Um, you know, you're, you're taught, I was taught the whole sticks and stones thing. And so teachers kind of took that on as well, not recognizing um, or not wanting to recognize that okay, you have a student in class who is getting in trouble and you haven't given her the opportunity to explain why she's so angry. Um, because I was constantly picked on, hair pulled, teased, you know, the, the, the notes, all of that stuff was going on with me. But, you know, we don't catch the initiator. The retaliator always gets caught. So I was always being caught um, in trying to defend myself. So um, that was the biggest hurdle to overcome. Being at, um, my high school was 50-50, white and black. So I really got the comfort there because there were half of the students that looked like me. Um, prior to that, it was less than 10% um, of us who were you know, of color. In elementary school, um, I was one of three Blacks in the entire school. So <clears throat> you just, I don't think that at the time teachers really realized, okay, you have a student who's different. Perhaps this student could be experiencing something that I don't see and I'm not aware of. So that was, that was the um, biggest problem for me. So, and it didn't happen uh, in high school, obviously, and it definitely did not happen at Lincoln. Thank you. Joe, did you have any questions? Uh, yes, uh, oh, that thing's not appearing, that's okay. Um, I guess from your administrator hat, do you see students um, either maybe starting at a non-HCBU um, non and then transferring in after a year? And in the other direction, do you see students that maybe start with you for a year or two and then maybe they want to pursue a degree that is not uh, offered by you and then they transition to uh, another school? Yes, we, we see that. Um, uh, I had a friend who did exactly that during, our, during my Lincoln years. So we have students who are coming in from other institutions. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, I don't see them all, but the ones that I see um, within my department um, many of them were athletes and they had gotten scholarships um, from other institutions and decided for whatever reason. And I, I cannot tell you um, that it was um, or ever is a racial thing. It's not always that at all. Sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's not. Um, it could have been it was just too far away from home or things didn't work out the way um, they had expected. And so they decided that they were going to um, go to an HBCU. And so, yes, have had that. Um, we have students who transition out from Lincoln, like every other institution. Um, they change their minds. Uh, things happen at home. 
uh, Lincoln didn't have the program uh, that they were hoping for. And so they decided to go to go elsewhere. The percentage of the time that those things actually happen, I'm unsure. But yes, we, we do see that. We definitely do see that. And so we encourage our students, you know, either way, because it's not about us, it's about them. So whatever move uh, is in their best interest, if that means to move away from Lincoln, we're sorry to see you go, but we wish you all the best, right? Um, if that means moving from another school into Lincoln, you know, we're happy to have you and we're gonna do whatever we can to um, help you uh, realize your goals. We're seeing some really amazing discussion in the Slack channel uh, for this keynote presentation. I hope you'll all check it out. Uh, there's some highlights of some of the historical figures that Dr. <laughs> Hilton mentioned. And then um, uh, John Drazen has also posted some of the reactions from his students after a um, after a uh, student project highlighting some of this history with the students uh, noting that they felt very motivated by seeing Lincoln graduates in these prominent places mm -hmm. um, gave them some confidence that they really needed. Um, let's see, where was... Oh, and <laughs> as you might have seen, there was also some comments and, and uh, respect given that you've maintained your, your high school or college ID this long. <laughs> so I, I saw that. I tried to answer back through <laughs> chat, but I did something wrong, so I apologize. So okay. um, if that person's listening, I, I put a lot of the stuff in a photo album. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions for us at this time? I think John Drazen had a, a question, but he put it on Slack. Oh, there it is. I see it. Channel. It's now in here. So <laughs> the question says, what is the Horace Mann Bond Scholarship? Oh, okay. Thank you, John. I forgot to mention that. So the Horace Mann Bond, uh, Horace Mann Bond Pinckney Scholarship, I believe, it is um, a scholarship that is offered to uh, graduates of um, Lincoln and Cheney to attend um, PASHI schools um, on the master's level. And they're, if they meet the criteria, and I'm not gonna tell you I know all the criteria, I know that you have to be a Pennsylvania resident. That's the only criteria that I know right offhand but they have the opportunity to attend those schools and earn their master's degree um, completely free. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we have had, and we do now have students who are um, either involved or about to be involved with that scholarship uh, program. So it's a great, great opportunity if um, they can meet the, whatever the criteria is for that. So yeah, Lincoln and Cheney students, HBCU students can go to um, PASHI schools, like I said, you know, uh, SHIP, um, Millersville, Westchester, all of those schools. I think Temple is included in that. Don't quote me on that though. I think Temple is involved with that um, for free and the scholarship covers tuition and everything. Great. Just to just for a note for our non-Pennsylvania attendees, PASHI schools are the Pennsylvania state schools. Um, mm -hmm. There are, I don't even know how many, but there's somewhere in the range of five to 15 of them across the state, um, maybe a few more. And we, Penn State and Temple, I think are state assisted, so not actually okay. PASHI. Um, all right. Oh, and and we're getting notes that this is relevant for PT schools as well as master's degrees. Yes. Um, all right. I have one more question. Uh, it says, how do you navigate a space where your observations or comments may be seen as aggressive or overly sensitive based on gender and ethnic stereotypes? That's a very good question. And um, it is challenging. And so I'm not sure I can um, answer that very well, but I, I try to step lightly. Um, what, I've, what I have learned to do, uh, again, is to 
put aside my own biases um, regarding, you know, whatever the, the, the topic is, those overly sensed, you know, gender issues, ethnic issues. Uh, I try to put aside my own biases personally. Um, I try to avoid them as much as possible. I know it's not always avoidable. Um, it does come up. And so I just, I try to stay as neutral as possible. And um, one thing that I am learning and I'm trying to teach my students in a class that I'm teaching uh, in cultural health is identifying your own, uh, your own biases and your own prejudices and to see where those things may impact um, your reactions um, to other individuals. And so we, we talk about those, those kinds of things. And, and I let them know, I'm not immune to it either. You know, um, I'm, still, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm a lifelong learner. And so when I recognize um, that probably something that I have said was insensitive, not meaning for it to be insensitive, I will be the first to come and apologize. Uh, I think um, that kind of response goes a long way. You know, it's okay to be wrong. As long as you're wrong, you know, I know that you're wrong and you can say that you're wrong and apologize for it, then to just glance over it and act like it never happened. And I think that is where you'll run into problems. So that would, that's my, uh, my best advice in, in, in navigating that is to step lightly, um, try not to say too much uh, about it if you're uncomfortable with it. And then if you do overstep, be quick to apologize. And um, I would also say apologize in the broad sense of the, the word, you know, so if it's during a classroom session and you may have said it um, to one student in front of the class, then apologize to the entire class. Um, so that's, that's kind of the way I, I run it for myself. I hope that's helpful. I think that's very helpful and a great place to conclude our keynote session. Thank you again, Dr. Hilton, for your personal and professional insights. Uh, we really appreciate the words that you've spoken today and shared the historical facts. I think that it was very uh, enlightening for many of us. And again, we'd like to give you a big round of applause and a big thank you for joining us for this ASB East Coast meeting today.